Church of the Nazarene. Good morning. Um, in Psalm 116, David says, um, I have given my heart to the Lord because you have heard my cries and my prayers. Have you given your heart to the Lord? Have you given him your cries and your prayers? You know what? You don't even have to give them to him. He already knows. Let's stand up and sing it. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this day that we could come together as a family and seek your face. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be welcomed in this place, that you would speak to us. God, many of us need to hear your voice. Lord, we need you to be a part of our lives. Father, as a family, we are asking for you to move in great ways. Jesus, we thank you for loving us and drawing us closer and closer. God, that you have had mercy on us. And I pray right now today as we are here, as we're gathered, that our eyes and our hearts will be fixed upon you. And we would sing praises and worship to the God most high. Lord, we say that you are good. And it's in your holy name that we pray. And all God's children said, amen, amen. You may be seated. For those who don't know, I am Pastor Eddie, and uh, I, I am wearing, uh, I felt like it's, it's a time for us to, uh, to beseech the God of God, uh, the Lord of Lords in prayer. Uh, the New York Giants are doing horrible this year, and so uh, so uh, uh, Tony decided to 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 share with me a, a mask that says, "Despite how low things get, we can we can stand by those that we support." And so, and they're having a horrible season this year, 
And so, but that's okay. This isn't about football, right? This is about life. And so we've come here today as a church to gather and to, to, to be not just refueled and refreshed, but, but to be encouraged to go forth in the mission that God has for us. And so as a church, we, we, we share with each other things that are going on. So just so everybody knows, some of the things that are happening within our body, we have uh, some special uh, missions that are happening here within our church. So we don't just take care of missions uh, globally, but we participate in missions locally. And so one of the ways is uh, Joyce has been uh, gathering up supplies for our crisis care kits. And so as the Nazarene Church, we participate with this with other churches here in our district. And so we gather specific items that we collect and we put it into a big Ziploc bag. And these items would include a shampoo bottle, two bars of soap, uh, uh, um, a tube of toothpaste, toothbrushes, band-aids, clippers, combs, towels, pocket-sized packages of Kleenexes, even uh, uh, Beanie Baby-sized little toys inside these care kits. And so we send them off to different countries that, that have had like a natural disaster. And this is, this is a temporary relief packet. This is something, something that we could give to them to help in the midst of that. And so we have a full list, and uh, we've been taking donations for that. But if you want to participate or, or, or you, have, you want to share or be a part of this, uh, Joyce is our contact. Do you have something you wanted to Yes. So, so for those who didn't hear that, we, we're, it's not just overseas, but it's locally too. So a few years ago during Katrina, uh, they, they were handed out. And so, and we're sending them down to Texas. Okay. So, uh, so if you want to be a part of that, please contact and let Joyce know after church. Put your mask on and talk to her. So we have the list in the bulletin. Uh, just for those who don't know, whether you're watching online or you're coming here in person, we haven't been handing out a paper bulletin because it's all electronic. So it makes it easier. If you haven't received it, I'm going to tell you two things. One, check your junk and spam. And then two, find Joe Ambrose and, and connect with him to make sure that we have the right email. And you Sometimes, might find Joe with your junk and, junk and spam too. So that's yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. So, but it's important to check your email because we send out our prayer requests that way. We send out our bulletin, special events and things going on. For instance, this week, Petey had, uh, we had a special event that happened on Saturday. You want to stand up at the microphone and just let everybody know what happened on Saturday and then what you're doing next week. Yeah. So, but we're using the microphone because there are people watching online. Good morning. So, like, I know people like Barbara DeLeon. I know, and I'm going to call them out, I know, like, Bill and Natalie, they're oh, yeah. online, and so Wait they're by. watching. Um, there, there's plenty of people, Carmen Ramos and David Ramos, Carmen. and so, uh, so our church family is bigger than just those who, who are here, right? So the Lord has used technology, and our service is larger. There are people in other states who are watching. Uh, I know other countries, uh, last few weeks, I've been getting messages from people from Brazil, who are watching our services, and South Africa, and, and so all over the place. So we want to welcome those who are watching. But Petey, would you share, what, what did we do last week? So, um, last night, it was last night, right? We had an awesome uh, youth event. We did zombies versus humans, and Eddie was playing with us. We were running around like we were kids. It was awesome. We had a time of prayer, and the kids get to share the highs and lows of the week, which I think they all need, kind of need that right now. And this is a safe place to do it. And then I don't know if you guys remember, but we were gonna do that big fundraiser for Carly Covell, the, the restaurant night. Yeah. And since we couldn't do that because of COVID, they're doing a big fundraiser on October 14th at their home. And some of the New York Jets are gonna be there. And I just want, yeah, the kids will probably be in school, but I want letters, notes, from us that I could bring there, just saying that we're praying for them and that we're here, you know? 
she has ALS and it's just such a scary thing to have. You know, you know everything that's going on and you can't use your body. And I just feel like us as a body reaching out can lift her up in prayer and just, the more notes I can bring from kids, even, even the adults, would just lift her spirits and maybe help George out as well. And also like for people that are shut in in our own church, I wanna start doing that. You know, Mickey, uh, if we don't see Rhoda for a while, I wanna start Mary Cornell, like just start loving on them from afar. And kids' notes and pictures is the best way to do it. So if you're interested in writing a little note and putting it in an envelope, see me after church and I'll gladly take it. That's amazing, thank you, PD. So we also have another way that we're staying connected. So I'm going to have Elisa come up. She wanted to share a little bit. Uh, so we can, we can, can we dance? Is that okay? A little dance of victory here. So uh, a little celebratory. There you go. So, uh, so you want to share with them what we got done finally? Okay. So as some of you know, we started a project use... pre-COVID. I guess I have to scoot up. Um, Pre-COVID for our directory. And then things got in our way and we got halted in our success of completing that. And so I just wanted to say we have our first official directory here with all of everybody's lovely pictures in it. Um, and this one actually belongs to Kathy because she has been on top of me to get her one. She's been very diligent. I have to give her credit for that. But um, what I'm going to do instead of passing around a paper for us to each be touching is if you want a hard copy, let me know, and I will keep a list. And first people on the list will get the first copies, and we'll go from there just because they are um, a little time-consuming, and so it will take some time to put them all together. But it's another thing you get through the lovely email. So everybody has access to the email. There is a hard copy of this on there that you can look at. So if digital copy works for you, go for it. If you want a hard copy, let me know. Uh, Sounds great. Uh, you only have four children. What do you do all day? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I've been blessed with this, this woman who, uh, she, she is, she's done a great job with this. And so it does take a little time to put them because she's doing it all herself. So if you're interested in wanting a copy, please see Elisa afterwards. Um, it, it is from the pictures that we received were all the way from... I'm trying to remember when the last picture day we had. So if you open it up and you notice, hey, I'm not in there and I want to be in there, we will do an update every six months. And so you won't throw these directories away. We're not about wasting things. We're just going to give you an updated version. And so you can slip in a couple extra copies for people's pictures. So if you see it, you look through it, you're like, my picture's not there. I'd like my picture to be in there. Talk to Elisa after church. Uh, I believe that's all the announcements we have. So at this time, why don't you stand with us and we're going to continue on with worship and prayer and the message. All right, everybody. Here's an oldie but a goodie. Here 
red sun Father's spirit son The lion and the lamb The lion and the lamb How great is our God Sing with me How great is our God All will see how great
We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. We believe. We believe. Do you believe? Would you join us for a time of prayer? I, I asked our, our, our brother Tony to, to lead us in this time. To lift you up. Because, Lord, when we lift you up, we get healing. We become whole. Father, we love you. And Lord, I'm learning to pray your word back to you. So I'm going to pray from Ephesians 3.14. Sometimes these things move on their own. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth are named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might in the inner person so that Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith. Lord, we pray earnestly for this. And you, being rooted and grounded in love, which we do here every day, Lord, when we show up, we're being rooted and grounded in your love. Pray that we'll be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and breadth and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes understanding so that we, we may be filled with all the fullness of God. That want to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly build all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church throughout all the ages. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, church. Amen, 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 amen. You may be seated. God is good, amen? All the time, and all the time? Yes. So for those who don't know me and the way I preach, I am okay with some interaction uh, because the church is alive, just like that, just like that, Bruce. Now I'm going to have to check to see if there's bruises on my arm. <laughs> my goodness, brother. We are alive. We are not a dead body, but we are a living body. Amen? Amen. And so, so for those who might come here and thinking, man, I, I thought this was going to be a, a pretty mellow service. Uh, you walked into part two of... Looking over my notes, it's kind of crazy because we've been going through the book of Ephesians for the last several weeks, even months. And, and last week, I split up the message into two parts, and the topic is spiritual warfare. So you need to expect that this might be a little bit more lively at times, and that's okay because Jesus made us alive in him. And, and you know, one of, uh, as a non-Christian, when I would go to church, uh, I, I would uh, I was asked, you know, how was, how was service? How did you like it? And, and I would say, well, I didn't yawn as much this week as I did last week. 
So, uh, and, and my goal is not that you're leaving here tired and yawning and you're like, my goodness, when's he going to be done? Uh, my hope is that you are hearing from the holy and living God and that I'm going to step back and I'm going to let him speak through me and that you would hear him speak to you because God wants to talk to you. God wants to change you. God wants to use you. Part of our mission we are Massapequa Park, Church of the Nazarene, so uh, we like to joke around and shorten that up a little bit because it's a lot to say. So we are MPK Church, and so as a part of this church, we have a mission, and that's to reach people, to teach people, to mend people, and to send people. And so today, there's a little bit of teaching going on, but for the purposes of being mended and healed and so if you have your Bible, uh, I, I kind of labeled the second part of, uh, of spiritual warfare. We're calling it being armed and dangerous, being armed and dangerous. So if you have your Bible, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 13, and we're going to end on 18, 13 to 18. And this is a reading of the written word of God. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor. So you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be still, still be standing firm. So stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Amen? Amen. So years ago, prior to living here in New York, we lived in Pennsylvania, and before Pennsylvania, we lived in Oregon. And uh, I, was, I was blessed, right? So Oregon is a, it's a totally different part of the country. They, they like their pizza skinny with pineapple on it. There's coffee carts all over the place. Uh, you ever wonder where all the hippies went? They just moved out there after, after the 70s. So, uh, but it was there, you know, where, where I, I, I had a great opportunity to connect up with a couple of other pastors who are like-minded and they love being active. And one of them specifically, he was a youth pastor in the town we worked at and we would train together, we would work out together, we would jog together. And he was into mixed martial arts and so we would box together. And all of a sudden, like the Puerto Rican inside of me came out when I started boxing. It was like, man, I really love this. I love hitting things, right? And so I would put on the sparring equipment and uh, I had my headgear on and my gloves and everything, and we'd go at it. And I remember one time, I, uh, I was done after a session, and I'm calling Elisa. I'm like, Elisa, this was the greatest thing ever. It says, we were going a couple rounds, and it was great. And, and man, he hit me hard. Like, I saw actual lights. And she's looking at me, and she's like, Eddie, why is there blood all over you? I said, it was the greatest thing ever. Like, I felt alive because I got hit really hard. And, uh, and it was exciting, and it, and it filled me. And, and I enjoyed doing that. Well, part of, my, part of the training, we got a, a heavy bag, and we would keep it outside. If you go to the parsonage, you'll see it now. It's in the garage, but this was in a carport outside. So I had a guy come over for counseling, and he was going through something pretty rough in his life. He was angry. I mean, he was really angry. And so when he left our house, he saw this bag sitting there, and he thought to himself, I just want to hit something. So he pulled his arm back and wind up as hard as he can, and he cracked that bag. And, and then he left. Well, the next day, I got a phone call from his wife. And, and she said, well, Pastor, I just, I just got to tell you. So apparently, my, my husband decided to hit your heavy bag outside of your house. He was pretty angry. And I just got back from, from the hospital where he broke his wrist because he hit your bag so hard that he hurt himself. 
And I learned something valuable. We only hurt ourselves when we act foolishly enough to fight unprepared. You learn when you're doing training that you never hit a heavy bag as hard as you can without being taped up and using gloves because your body alone cannot handle it. You will hurt yourself. You will break yourself if you are unprepared. How many times have, how many times have we hurt ourselves because we were unprepared for the battle that was in front of us? That we decided to, to do things on our own and use our own understanding and be like, I can handle this. And we act our own strength. And man, we have damage. And we walk around with a broken wrist. And then we have to share the story. Why did I hurt myself? Because of my own foolishness. I believe that in this passage, Paul was preparing a people, a church... Not to be foolish, but he is actually, all we've read up to this point, he's preparing the church to be the church. And he talks of this theological discussion of who they are in God and the mystery of us and who we are called to be. And he ends on this point of spiritual walkings and spiritual warfare and who we are in Christ. And he does this so that we would stand firm. Last week I said that we are in the middle of a cosmic rebellion that is carried over and spilled over to this earth. And so it is both a cosmic and physical rebellion against God. That there is a real enemy that comes to tempt us and accuses us. And we need to be wise towards his schemes and his strategies. That we need to stand firm. Okay, and that doesn't mean that we're prepared to, to, to take a blow, but, but standing firm in the Greek, it's, it's a military term. It means that we, uh, we ourselves are getting in a battle-ready position, okay? A battle-ready position. It doesn't mean you're just going to take a blow. It means you're getting ready to go to war, and that is completely different. So if you've seen any of, the, any of the movies Hollywood puts out about Roman centurions and and their strategies for going to war, you'll see them lining up with their armor, working together as a full unit, taking ground. And, and Paul, part of the Roman Empire, but, but a Jew, he saw a, a Roman guard where he was at. For those who don't know, and, and maybe you haven't grown up studying the Bible, the book of Ephesians is written by the Apostle Paul, who, when he was writing this letter, he was in prison. So it's probable that there's a guard sitting there. So as he's writing this letter, he sees his guard, and he takes these images that he sees in front of him, and being a Jew from the book of Isaiah, it talks about the armor of God in the, by the prophet Isaiah. So Paul is, is using this imagery to explain to us how to be prepared to go to war. He's using a culturally relevant illustration to explain to us. Maybe some of us, we need to, to change the illustration just a little bit so that we don't think of it as, we, we don't have our military walking around in, in a full-on body armor like Paul did, but maybe we need to think about it in, in more of a, a contextual time, more of in a present illustration. But for whatever way, Paul uses this analogy. And he's, he's, writing, in, he's writing in a place of, of bondage, talking about freedom that we could experience in Jesus. And he's writing to a people that, that we have to remember while we're reading this, that it, the church in Ephesus was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. But besides being the third largest city, that this is a city that's known to be hospitable to magicians and sorcerers and spiritual people. So this kind of language wasn't, wasn't new to them. This was something that they were, they were well versed in. It was known as, as a magical center. Uh, Clinton Arnold, who's the assistant professor of New Testament studies at Biola University, he wrote this book, and it is not a very engaging book. But in preparing for this, I, I wanted to read a, a small quote from him in the book Ephesians, Power and Magic. He says this, 
The epistle was written to an area famed as the center for magical practices in Western Asia Minor. Presumably, and according to Luke, many converts came into the church for, uh, uh, with a background of magical practices. It is then clearly conceivable that the appraisal could be concerned with addressing issues uh, arising in the community related to the former practices of magic on the part of some of the converts. In other words, the new believers had a lot of pagan baggage, had a lot of baggage in, in the spiritual arts and other practices and other beliefs. And so as they came into the church, they realized there's stuff that they had to deal with. And Paul needs to address this. He knows that this subject is needed to be talked about. They were aware of the spiritual realm. And they were knee deep in it. This is something that I shared last week, saying that people from other countries who read this, they don't blow it off. But for some reason in our country, we, we think of this as the old ways and the unspoken. But the truth is that we need to be more aware of this now more than ever. You know, Paul, as he's preaching about this, just to lay this groundwork out, you talk about who, uh, who and why, why would the, he talk about this subject? And, and you, you read throughout the book of Acts multiple times that he interacts with spiritual beings, demonic beings, uh, women and men who, who are filled with these spirits and he has multiple different interactions and you can see the power of God demonstrated through him, not because of him, but through him and people were aware of this. In the book of Acts chapter 19, there's a story of the seven sons of Sceva who see this work in Paul and they attempt these incantations. They try to copy the power. They're like, look what Paul is doing. He's casting out demons. We can do this. So they listen to him and they say these words, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out to this demon. And this man who's filled with the Spirit looks at him and says, I know Jesus, I know Paul, but who are you? What gives these men the right to make these commands? And what was different between them and Paul? See, he said, I know Jesus, and I know Paul. And Paul says constantly in the scriptures, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm nothing more than a vessel of the Holy Spirit. Paul was a believer, and he was filled with the power from on high, just like the church is called to be. But these men, these brothers, who saw this and witnessed it, they had no relationship with God. And so when they tried to speak in authority, they kept falling on their face because the groundwork wasn't laid. They had no relationship with Jesus, so they had no right to talk and command to any kind of evil spirit. So they were struggling with this. And eventually they got beat up. And, and so the groundwork is laid off saying, listen, what gives Paul the right to actually speak into these these powers and principalities is that he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul is saying, guess what, church? You are too. So it's not just me. You're going to do these things. There's a reason why Jesus himself said, greater things you're going to do. Do you understand that there, that there is a power there that is given to the church? And it is not the building or the organization, but us as people. The Holy Spirit has filled us to claim our authority. But a lot of us don't understand that you have authority, just like Paul did, if you believe in Jesus, if you have a relationship with him. Paul's instructions weren't to radicalize the church. It was to equip the church to say, hey, get ready. You're in a war. You're, getting to, you're, you're in this fight. There's no escaping this fight if you're a follower of Jesus, so be prepared. I hope you know how to do this. Dr. Tony Evans said this. According to Paul, everything visible and physical is preceded by something invisible and spiritual. I want to say this again. Everything visible and physical is preceded by something invisible and spiritual. And a lot of us want to take this fight and, and focus on the physical. We want to focus on what we can see and touch. But he's saying, listen, there's something greater here. 
we need to understand that Paul has equipped the church not to fight with natural weapons, but to fight with spiritual weapons. And understand that we're not fighting against physical beings around us, but there's something greater at work. So when you're arguing with your spouses, with your teachers, with your bosses, with that insurance company who just won't work with you, maybe there's something greater that's working in that situation. There's something bigger at work there. When evil is present and you see sins are being committed, injustice is happening time and time again on the news, and and your first judgment call is to say, it's my school's fault. It's, It's the justice system's fault. It's the president's fault. It's whatever you put into it. Let me just say this. There is a power at work within this world that is greater than any organization, person, or system that's out there. And so when you want to take the fight to your spouse, and you're like, I don't understand why we keep having a bad day. It's like one thing after another after another. Maybe, maybe there's something spiritual going on that you don't realize, and that they are not your enemy. Maybe God wants to awaken our eyes to something that's very present and all around us. Now, I'm not saying and I'm not excluding our participation in doing evil things. We're held accountable for the actions and the sins we've committed. Okay, I'm held accountable for the stuff that I do. And so there's a real tangible part of me that, that has to take responsibility and a change that's needed to happen. But Paul is saying, listen, it's greater than just the physical realm. So if you're just working on the physical realm and you're just dealing with the physical things that are present with you, you're just going to get physical results. Is there a reason why people continue to say, listen, I want to follow Jesus. I'm hungry for Jesus. I'm trying to change. I have these old patterns and and, and things that are in my life. And so I'm going to counseling sessions and it's been 10 years. I'm dealing with this thing and I don't understand what's going on in me. Like I can't control and fight the demons that continue to fight me. I'm going, I'm popping my pills. I'm going to, I'm going to counseling. I'm asking people, but we understand this is I haven't decided to take to war against the powers of darkness that's working in my life. I've just kind of excluded that. And and Paul is saying, it's more than just the physical. I'm not saying remove the physical. I believe the scriptures say there is something greater here. I believe, and I'm going to say this, I believe people need counseling. There's plenty of times. If you've met with me, you'll you'll hear me say this, that I will... I am okay with having some pastoral counseling, and sometimes you'll need to talk to a professional who's maybe a psychologist or psychiatrist. But let me just say something. There is power in pleading the blood of Christ over people that sometimes we forget to do, and we don't go to war. And so we try to think, how can I physically take care of something? I'm like, listen, have you gone to your knees and started praying and asking God to do great things? Because maybe it's not just a physical problem going on. Maybe there's spiritual things And Paul is saying, listen, in verse 13, Paul is absolutely concerned about the evil day. He says, therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Some translations will say, in the evil day. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That day when all hell has come out after you. And it's like one thing after another and after another. And you're like, I don't know what's going on. I can't explain this. It's like you're not getting a break. There's a death in the family. Then your boss is berating you at work. And then you come home to the IRS is hounding you. Like, why am I getting audited? And it's like, I can't under, I don't understand what's going on and what's happening here. And it is more than just a, 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 a little situations that, that, that it's a coincidence that this is happening. But it's possible that you yourself are under attack. Spiritual attack. When, when God is crying out to you and wanting you to pay attention to what's happening around you in that evil day, that Paul talks about what are we doing? And his instruction is put on every piece of God's armor. And you do this so that you'll be able to resist the enemy. Listen, I try to resist the enemy on my own. I'm just going to get thrown on my feet. 
But if I'm prepared and equipped the way that I'm supposed to, when I punch that punching bag, I'm not going to break my wrist. But I'm going to have a positive result in the purposes that God has called me to. Amen? So I want us to consider this. If you are going through that evil day, in that time of evil, if you're in the midst of an attack from the enemy himself, are you prepared? Are you equipped? Do you feel like you are wearing the full armor of God in everything that you're doing? Now, I don't know how many of us have studied this and read this, and I know it's popular. Maybe if you've gone through Sunday school, children's church, and there's songs about it all online and everywhere, and you might know songs about it right now when you're talking about the full armor of God. But, but there's a, there's a, a, a I want to say, a practical purpose for us to study this as adults because we understand that spiritual warfare is not only real, but it's something we're a part of. And Paul's saying, listen, if you're going to be the church, you need to be prepared to do this. How many of you are in the middle of that day right now that you're experiencing it? But you need to be prepared. You need to be ready to fight. And you need to have the right weapons to fight. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it says this, the weapons that we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. These weapons that we're given have divine power to demolish strongholds. What does that mean? That means you have been given the power and authority to break strongholds in your life, in others' lives, and and in the world around you. Do you understand when Jesus, when people experience freedom and joy and victory in their lives in the scriptures, there was power there. And Jesus is saying, I have given this power to you. You fight with these powerful weapons. So you ready to fight? I'm going to go to work here for a second. Okay. So we're going to go through these, these, this list that Paul kind of opens up to us. And I'm going to, I'm going to suggest a couple things. I split it up in, in, in half, kind of. I have these two headings. How do you fight in a spiritual conflict? How do you fight in a spiritual conflict? And how are we equipped? What are, uh, how are we equipped with protection? How do we fight? And how are we equipped for protection? So you can say, what's, what's our weapons? And what's our armor? What's our defense? And I believe the scripture, it, the scripture speaks towards this. And, and you're going to hear different, if you've done any studies on this, you're going to hear different theologians and pastors have have split up this list in different ways. And, and what I'm going to present to you is just a very intentional way for us to look at this. And I'm going to start with our protection. So he talks about truth, right? So in this passage here, we read that in verse 14, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. So I believe that this truth is something that we need as part of our armor, specifically because what it does, it holds everything together. The truth of the gospel is essentially God's truth or God's view of reality. God sees everything as it is. Truth is reality. And and the truth is what holds everything we have together. And if we don't have the truth, everything else falls apart. And Jesus said plainly and clearly, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Jesus declared that he is the truth. Listen, I, I've been to plenty of college campuses where when I start talking about that and it's like I have a target on my back. There is no absolute truth. What are you talking about? There is nothing so true. Let me, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus is more true than you could ever know and experience. And this gospel, this good news about him, this is true. We need to be people who believe the truth about who God is and who I am in Christ. This is our armor. 
if we don't believe the truth about who God is and who we are, and we've substituted that truth for lies, everything else falls apart. Your most vulnerable areas will be attacked from the enemy. Listen, if you don't believe you are a child of God, what do you think, what kind of field day the devil will play with you? If you don't believe that you are forgiven and shown mercy, what's going to happen in your life? If you don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is, how are you going to be able to stand and fight? You can't. It all falls apart if you don't know the truth. That we are sons and daughters of God. That we are joint heirs. That we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And it's important for us to, to, to have this protection against the lies of Satan. Because that's what he does. He's going to lie to you. He's going to deceive you. Okay? And so we need to have some protection against this. It protects us against false doctrines. If you don't have the truth that anybody can tell you anything and all of a sudden you're believing some crazy weird things. And trust me, there's some crazy weird things about Jesus. I'm looking at the time. Okay, so we, uh, after I came to Jesus, I, I worked in a missions organization and I was able to, to be a part and work with multiple different, organ, uh, uh, multiple different churches. And we just said pretty much, if they love Jesus, we love them and we can work with them and we didn't care. And then we worked within the denomination that I had the opportunity to, to go to one of their um, general assemblies. And, and one of the pastors was talking about his difficulties continuing to stay within this denomination. And he said, when the denomination voted to declare that the Bible isn't the word of God, I, I struggled. I'm like, you struggled? But then when the denomination voted and said that Jesus isn't the Christ and the only way to the Father, I, I, I've had a hard time redeeming that. And I looked at Elisa and I'm like, what in the world are we a part of? The name Jesus is in the actual name of the denomination that we're a part of. is a Christian denomination. And they have chosen to step away from the truth. And it is falling apart. And out of conviction, we had to leave. And we're like, I, I, know, I know good men and women who stayed and fought to see that place reformed. But we felt like we needed to separate ourselves because I couldn't be a part of a church that said Jesus isn't the only way to the Father. That there's multiple ways to the Lord. Do you understand? According to the Bible, not what I decide, if I'm looking to the scriptures, there is no other way to the Father except through the Son. And when you trade that truth in, man, everything else falls apart. So I want us to be prepared and to understand that this belt of truth is more important than we realize. We need to be men and women who know the truth. The second thing he gave us was righteousness. Sometimes in some translations they say the breastplate of righteousness or the body armor of righteousness. It goes over our hearts and it protects our hearts. It protects our wills. It protects our emotions. And it is not my self-righteousness, but it is the righteousness of God that protects me. It is Jesus' right standing that covers me. It is what he has done that covers me. We are made righteous by the cross. And because of that, my heart can be protected. My will can be protected. He puts that on me to enable me to do what is right. And so when we trade in doing what's right for doing what's wrong, well, then you've made yourself vulnerable. Put on the entire armor of God. Some of us, some of us forget to put on our breastplate sometimes. That we've chosen not to do what's right and to do what's wrong. And then we ask, why are all these horrible things happening to me? Do you know what Jesus has done for you? Do you take that up? Do you allow that to protect you? It is what he has done that protects my emotions. Because you know what? Let's just be honest. Our emotions 
I mean, they kind of go left and right sometimes, right? Sometimes we don't feel loved. We don't feel compassion. Sometimes we don't feel forgiven. But I have to remember, it was Jesus that made me right. And it is his act on the cross that has made me whole. And I, too, am called to put on that armor, not to just leave it there, but I have a responsibility to participate in the fight that's in front of me. So I put on that armor. And I think a lot of us have left it off. And Paul is saying that breastplate of righteousness protects us. There's images of this that comes from the book of Isaiah as well, where it talks about God's body armor, and God's breastplate is righteousness. When we substitute that, we make ourselves vulnerable to spiritual attacks. Amen? So the next, I want to say, the next article we go into is peace, okay? So this next uh, uh, equipment for protection, it is the gospel of peace. And so I know I'm jumping around in the scripture, but I want us to, to, to kind of to get at this. So verse 15, for shoes put on peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Okay, this isn't talking about getting yourself a new set of Jordans, right? This is the gospel of peace. It costs more than any sneakers ever will. The gospel of peace enables me to move in ways that I never thought was possible. The gospel of peace follows or is preceded, uh, it goes after knowing the truth. The gospel of peace protects my movement. This is not just about our standing with God. Okay, we know who we are in God. This is about despite that everything that's going wrong in my life, that there is peace that comes from God. And so we need our feet protected when those storms and those battles are raging that we keep pressing forward. Peace isn't the absence of chaos and conflict. We have peace in the midst of the conflict. And that's what the gospel speaks of. That that night on that cross was not a moment of serene beauty and sun shining and birds chirping, but there was darkness over the land, and yet the gospel was still proclaimed. The good news is that despite the sin and that is present in this world, our God still loved us. This speaks against what we think. And so when we're talking about the gospel of peace, the gospel of peace protects me to move forward despite all the things that are going on, that I am guarded and I am protected and I stand in the peace that comes from God, that the Holy Spirit speaks to us through peace. So when we talk about our feet being protected by the gospel of peace, it refers to this movement that we have, the gospel is more than just getting us to heaven. The gospel is about bringing heaven to earth. And I want you to think about this, that when we preach this message, it's not just I'm sitting here and I want people to come to Jesus and that's it, you're done. But in the Lord's Prayer, what are we asking the Father to do? Somebody want to recite it for me, somebody who hasn't memorized the Lord's Prayer. You can say it out loud. It's okay. On earth as it is in heaven. Wait, wait, wait. We want his kingdom to be where? On earth as it is in heaven. Listen, you are, if you've prayed this out before, you're saying, God, I want your will to be done here just like it is there. And that message comes from the gospel. Do you understand? It's not just about getting people saved and get out of here because this place is going to hell in a handbasket. This is not it. Jesus is saying, I have changed you to change what's in front of you because I am taking this world back. I am restoring all things unto me. And one day everything will be restored. And that is the good news And so when we have the gospel, we're able to move forward and to fight and to know that I've been given this gospel of peace no matter what is going on around me. 
I am called to be a child of God who fights and moves forward. Amen? And you are too. So when you're getting stuck and you feel like you just can't move forward anymore, that is a lie from the devil himself because you're forgetting the gospel. Salvation is the next piece that we are protected by. The gift of salvation or he talks about put on salvation as your helmet, the helmet of salvation. Okay. Why would Paul talk about salvation as a headpiece? I believe that this armor piece is very crucial for us when we're talking about engaging into spiritual warfare because our mind in itself is a battlefield. I don't know about you, but plenty of times when things are going on and stress is happening, how many of us get stuck in our own heads? And it's like, if we can't just get on our own heads, it's like we're not willing to move forward. It's like all of a sudden, everything that could ever happen, uh, uh, we're, we're sitting there for conversations. And, and I ask Elisa, what are you thinking about? And, and I get this like two-page paragraph of all the things that are going on in her head. And she's like, what are you thinking about? Dinner. But I understand there's times where she's talking to me and it's like I have this look on my face and she says, what's going on? And it says, I'm dealing with things. And I'm dealing with things. What do you mean you're dealing with things? I'm dealing with things up here. I'm processing. I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the people that I might have offended in the week. I think about whether or not somebody heard the message that I shared the right way. I'm thinking about all of these things and I get lost in my own head. And I forget that there is a battlefield going on in my mind. And there's a reason why our mind is vulnerable. This armor piece is crucial. We need to protect what we think, what we hear, what we say and speak. The Bible says to take every single thought captive. So if we're sitting there and, and all of a sudden, you know, someone tells you, you're just in a, uh, in a conversation and, and this thought comes in and they, they tell you like, ah, oh, you're, you're not that smart. And all of a sudden this little thought starts to enter his way into your brain and you have a choice. You, you, can, you can allow this thing into your life and do some damage. Say, wait, maybe, yeah, you're right. I'm not that smart. I did pretty bad in school. And, and you know, my, my folks would constantly tell me that I'm not smart. And, and all of a sudden, the enemy just slips in. It's like an open door into our soul. And the Bible is very clear saying, listen, take every thought captive. The Holy Spirit is inside you. And so we, we picture it like, like some guards sitting there in, 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 in the entrance into our soul. And, and you get to choose what you allow in and not in your life. You get to choose whether this is of God or it's not of God. But you need to be willing to know that you have to stop things from always jumping in there. Because a lot of us will hear things as, well, this is the way I'm supposed to be, right? This is the way I was raised, and this is what my life is called like. So that must be true. But we don't take them captive and say, no, in Jesus' name, this is not true. I'm not going to let you tell me who I am. I'm not going to let you. I'm not going to believe the lies that you have of me, devil. I'm not going to listen to you and say that I'm not fit to be God's child. I'm going to sit here and fight. And sometimes we need to learn and understand that our mind is a true battlefield happening every single day. And you have to be willing to fight and know and plead that the salvation of Christ. Oh, Jesus changes us. And we need to know, but we know, but we know who he is and who he's called us to be that we have to allow ourselves to be men and women who use our mind to worship him. That we rest in the idea that Jesus has given me salvation. And if I can allow that to protect my mind and my thoughts, if I put on the helmet of salvation, this battlefield will be quenched. It won't be over, right? Because there's going to be new thoughts and new temptations and new problems. But now I'm protected. You know, uh, like I said, when I was sparring, I, I wore a headgear so that I wouldn't get knocked out. But it didn't mean I didn't get beat up a little bit, right? 
It just meant I was in the midst of a fight. And so when you're wearing that headgear, it's there to protect you. But understand, you're still going to go through battles. It doesn't negate the battles. It protects you in the midst of the battle. And those pieces that I've spoken to, those are pieces that I truly believe are, are, have been given to us and have equipped us to protect us. But when we start talking about going on the offensive, how do we fight in spiritual conflict? Not just sit there and take it, but how do we actually fight and engage it? And I believe there's three major things within this passage. Through prayer, through the spoken word, and being persistent in faith. And we're going to see those three weapons that God has given us. When we talk about through prayer at the end of that passage, and I know a lot of people will sometimes will, will stop on verse 17, put on salvation as your helmet and take on the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and we stop there. But verse 18 kind of stands alone, but not really, because then he says, he talks about one of the most powerful weapons that we have. He says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Because there is something powerful about prayer. It is a weapon that you've been given by God himself. You have been given access to the Lord of Lords through prayer. And our prayers are not something that we need to just cast off to the side. But it is a weapon that you have to engage in spiritual conflicts. It is a weapon of warfare. The battle on the ground is determined by our connection to that we have to heaven itself. And if I'm going to fight, I need to be connected. If I'm going to engage into things, I'm not just going to say, well, hopefully God gets me through this. I need to be persistent in my prayers. Are you going through spiritual conflicts? Yes. Are you praying about it? Well, kind of. I pray right before dinner and before I go to bed. Then go lock yourself in a closet. Get in a car. Lock the door and hide from your kids. I don't know. Do whatever you need to do to pray and engage with God himself. But if we're going to see actual victories in our life, we need to be men and women who pray. We need to be connected to God through this. A lot of us want to see this victory without putting in the work. But the Bible is clear about fervent prayer. And all the times that us as disciples, we needed and we had and we will do pleading before the Father. Listen, prayer is a weapon that you have been given. Don't neglect it. Don't just treat it like it's something that, that we do on Sunday. We are called to be men and women who use this weapon. The second weapon is the spoken word, which is the sword of the spirit, okay? This is a powerful weapon that we have been given by God himself. This is the word of God. And Tony, you talked about it today. There is a power with the word of God. The written word of God has a power like nothing else. God has given you this word, but it is more than just paper and ink. It is not just here. If you see that all through the scriptures, that there are times that the word is reminded unto people when we're talking about what we believe and why we believe it and how we live, and the word continues to get brought back up. Jesus himself did not have a leather-bound Bible. But when the devil came in, what did he do? Oh, he used the spoken word. Hey, you stupid liar. You're trying to tell me that this is what God is, let me, let me tell you the truth. You know, because the devil knows the word, but he knows how to twist the word. It's, uh, it was brought up, uh, in, in, there was another pastor who was talking about this, and he says, you understand that the devil tries to speak truth through the word into our lives, but, but he leaves things out. So in the beginning of creation, it says the Lord God created and the Lord God did this and the Lord God did that and the Lord God did this. And then all of a sudden we have the scene of Eve in the garden with the serpent and it says this, God didn't say that. What did God really say? And for some reason, the name of God has changed. He refers to God as El, but, but not the Lord. 
And it's something that we can just bypass quickly when we're reading through the scriptures. But you notice that he says, he kind of tries to bring God down into a realm of other gods. And he doesn't call him Lord. The devil knows how to twist and manipulate the scriptures and the truth. That it looks nice and it feels close, but it's not really there. But the spoken word, according to the scriptures, is sharper than any two-edged sword. That when used, it effectively tears down strongholds which Satan has built up himself. Listen, Jesus used the scriptures against the devil, which means it is important for us to use it as we're praying. It is okay for you to say and claim scriptures out. Maybe it's even more important for us because we need to be reminded that the Bible is authoritative. It is authoritative to our lives. <coughs> what do I mean by that? It's an older word. It means it has the authority to speak into us. If I say something and the Bible says something opposite than me, who has the authority in the situation? The Bible. I want you to hear that. No matter what pastor, preacher, evangelist, whatever, we go against the scriptures. What small group leader, whatever... If we go against the scriptures, we are wrong. The Bible is the final authority. It is authoritative, and we can't forget its place. I'm not saying to worship the scriptures. I want you to hear me. I'm not telling you to worship the scriptures because we've seen men at times who worshiped the scriptures and forgot who Jesus was, and Jesus spoke to them. What I'm saying is to understand that it has an authority in our lives and we need to be willing to use that authority. Some churches think that it's not important or it's even untrustworthy nowadays. And, and, and people pick and choose what's in there. I'm not saying that. I ask, I'm asking you, I'm telling you to remember that the authority that this word has the enemy himself wants to make you doubt the scriptures, especially when it doesn't fit into your cultural context. And you're like, well, I don't want to, I'm not going to buy into that right now. He's trying to remove a very powerful weapon that you have. Listen, if I'm in a fight, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get rid of your weapons. And think about what the enemy has to do to remove the Bible, the spoken word. When you start to distrust this, he's done his job. He doesn't have to disprove it. He just has to get you to distrust it. Then you don't take it up. Then you're like, what does this have to do in my life? It's not worth me reading. That's old and outdated. That's, that stuff's not relevant to today. Do you understand? Like, Paul didn't get what was going on today. He doesn't understand how we need to be and how we need to talk. The enemy wants to remove the word of God from your hands and from your mind. And, and we need to be men and women who take this up and use it to engage in a real spiritual war that we're, we're a part of. And finally, persistent faith. This is a piece that isn't just given to us as, as a, a piece of our defensive a shield back then was about the size of a door, right? And so it was more than just stopping from being attacked. Well, while military men were in war during this time period, they used their shields to attack as well. It doesn't just negate or block the incoming attacks. It is an offensive weapon, okay? And so that it wasn't, uh, that it's meant to not just protect ourselves, but it's used to protect others, so when we're, looking, when we're thinking about the shield of faith, that is not something small, but it's something large. And it's not faith in ourselves, but it's our faith in God. Biblical faith is putting into action what God has already said to be true. This is more than just my feelings. Hebrews chapter 11 talks a lot about faith and the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we don't see. Our faith must be put into God, not into ourselves. But it is put into action. When the enemy tries to attack us with doubts and deceitfulness, we need to choose faith to combat those attacks. When all hell is breaking through, we need to believe that God will deliver you. 
and not just say you kind of do. And say, well, yeah, God's there, but when you do that, when you believe that, it's like you're walking around with the shield, but it's just like dragging along. And you need to place your faith in Christ. Know and remember all that he has done. You know, men have seen healing in others' lives because of their faith. Jesus makes comments about faith constantly throughout the scriptures. It says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, what would happen? You can move mountains. Now, moving a mountain doesn't sound like something that's very defensive-like, is it? That's very offensive-like. Our faith is essential in Christ when we're talking about fighting this spiritual warfare. Now, according to Ephesians 6, he gives us all of these tools, but the truth is not, not all of them are being used by us. He gives it to you, but he doesn't put it on you. That command is put to you. It's put on to me. The Bible commands you to put on the armor. Not for him. I want you to hear this. We have it. It's accessible to us, but it doesn't mean we're taking it up. It's there. It's present. It's waiting for you, but it doesn't mean you are equipped like you should be. God is not a helicopter mom. I'm sorry. He's not sitting there saying, hey, Johnny, don't forget to put on your helmet of salvation today. Don't forget your belt of truth. Remember how you looked last week when you're walking around with your pants down? That's not God. Hey, let me get that schmutz on your face. That is not God. God commands us to participate in this. And when we don't, we walk around like fools. It's not just us in church who need to hear this. But do you understand that there are plenty of people all over the world who have gone through intense situations who have forgotten their part in this? There's a missionary. His name was J.O. Frazier, and he writes this. Just how foundational prayer is the deployment of all the other weapons is vividly illustrated in the story of J.O. Frazier And then the China Inland Mission. Now it's called OMF. Fraser was a British missionary who worked among the Lysu tribe of people in southwest China from 1909 until his death in 38. To the Lysu, conversion had to be deliverance from the fear of the demon spirits they worshipped. That is, power encounter. When, when this did not occur, they frequently fell back into spiritual homage. Fraser's early years of ministry were difficult. He soon realized that his ignorance of the spirit realm was one of his major problems. The ignorance severely handica- handicapped his converts. They suffered continually demonic attacks, many returning to their former lifestyle, pacifying the abusive spirits. The result was terrible setbacks in Fraser's ministry. He had assumed that his converts, that he had assured his converts that Jesus is mightier than the spirits, but he did not know how to teach them the ways of victory. They were defeated by the demons again and again. And in one case, at least, Mrs. Taylor reports that some believers were reinvaded by the spirits. Fraser was still slow to believe that the demonization can be as real today as when our Lord was upon earth. One of his key families went back into demonism when a family member became seriously ill. God did not heal him in spite of their prayers. A diviner told them they must return to the spirit worship in order for him to be healed. They did. He died anyways, but it was too late. They had chosen again to serve the spirits that terrified them. Then Fraser, always a man of prayer, began to build an intercessory team in England. He could not form a team in Lesuland 
as he had no strong believers as of yet, Mrs. Taylor says that this was to become a very real sense of the power behind his work. At that time, Fraser himself went into deep spiritual depression. He didn't know at first what to make of it. Was it loneliness? Was it the poor food, the struggle with the language, or the, dead, uh, the deadlock in the work? As time wore on, he realized there were influences of another kind to be reckoned with. All he had believed and rejoiced in became unreal. Even his prayers seemed to mock him. Does God answer prayer? The questions tormented him. Thoughts of suicide persistently tempted him. Mrs. Taylor writes that deeply were the foundations shaken in those days and nights of conflict. He soon realized that behind it all were powers of darkness seeking to overwhelm him. Listen, it's not a fairy tale. Missionaries and pastors, lay people all over the world experience this. And we say, if we are not equipped for the warfare that we are in the midst of, we will feel defeated and overcome. We will feel like the enemy has the upper hand. We will not be able to understand why we're going through all the things we're going through and not seeing victory. I don't know about you, but I want to be successful and authoritative. I want to be a man of God who is victorious in his life, that I'm empowered by God. Do you want to be somebody who's walking through that type of victory? Do you want to be someone who walks through the victory that God has called you to be in? Is this something that you desire to see and experience? Then it's time for us to be familiar with our weapons of warfare and put them into action. Listen, we are called to be armed and dangerous. So now it's time to start seeing some of these strongholds in our life being torn down. We need to be willing to fight against the powers of darkness and engage in them fully equipped and prepared with the armor of God. And I'm calling you as a church to be willing to stand firm, to be equipped, to be prepared for warfare with one spirit and in one purpose. I'm going to invite you right now just to pray with me. And I'm going to pray this prayer over each of you. But would you bow your heads as we pray together this? Father, I come to you this morning and I put on the full armor of God. Out of Ephesians 6, what your word says is true. Lord, I know it might seem funny, but we want to visualize, visualize ourselves actually putting on this armor today. Just like we do when we try to get dressed. So, Lord, we put on the helmet of salvation. Father, this morning I put it on. I put on this helmet of salvation to guard my mind today, to guard what I think, what I hear, what I say, and what I speak. I subject every thought to the blood of Jesus. Help me to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Today I give no place to the enemy in my mind, and I declare today that I have the mind of Christ according to your word in Jesus' name. Lord, we put on the breastplate of righteousness to guard our hearts, to guard our will, to guard our emotions. It is not my righteousness, Lord, but it is the righteousness of Christ through what he did on the cross. Today, I will be righteous by the blood of Jesus. Father, protect us from reacting to circumstances and people emotionally. Let us respond with my spirit, not out of my emotions, in Jesus' name. Father, we put on the belt of truth today. We gird our loins with truth. We ask you, Jesus, to be the truth in our lives that we know that you are. Satan, you are a liar, and we will not believe you or listen to you today. Today, I choose to believe the truth about who God is and who I am in Christ. I am a son or daughter of God. I am a joint heir of Christ. I have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus I have been healed by the stripes that he bore on his back on the cross. I have been filled with the Holy Spirit, and today I will live a victorious life 
according to the word of God, which is truth in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you would shod our feet with the gospel of peace. Wherever my feet may take me, I will share your good news. I will use my life to be an expression of your deep inner peace. Your word says, beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Today, I will bring the good news of Jesus and the power of what he did on the cross to a dying and hurting world. Amen. Lord, today we pick up the shield of faith. I take up this shield which will, according to your word, quench the fiery darts of the enemy. The shield will not only stop these firing darts, Lord, and flaming arrows, but I choose to stand behind the shield in humility. I will be protected from every assault that comes against me in Jesus' name. Today I declare with my mouth that you, O Lord, are the only true and living God, and my faith is in you and you alone in Jesus' name. Lord, we pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts in both directions. Today I choose to use your words to come out of my mouth as a sword to effectively tear down strongholds which Satan has built up. Lord, your word says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. So today I choose life. I will use my words with caution so as not to harm people, but to destroy Satan's strongholds and schemes. Lord, put to guard upon my lips that I may not sin against you or others. I thank you for the sword of the Spirit, which is my offensive weapon. Lord, use me today to effectively tear down Satan's strongholds. Father, we come before you in prayer. Your word is true that we are called to be men and women who cry out to you. We want to be connected to you. We need you. We long for you. So Holy Spirit, would you fill us and empower us? Would we take up our equipment today and be prepared to fight? Lord, we declare that we will not back down, but we will stand firm in you. Father, we pray all these things. In Jesus' powerful name, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Church, you are called to be armed and dangerous. You are called to live like the warriors that God has called you to be. May you engage the physical and spiritual realm in this way. May you be willing to fight against the present evils that are all around you. I, I wanted us to have a bigger picture of what's happening in this world. And to know that you, you don't need to be beaten up anymore. You are called to fight. And fight we will. In Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. Amen. My fear doesn't stand a chance. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken
Don't be afraid.